it's not that there are several people who are Jesus. It is that uh, the Egyptian is several people in the New Testament. <laughs> Barabbas is also Jesus. You know what Barabbas means? Son of the Father. Yeah. And his name in Matthew is Jesus Barabbas. Okay. So the guy, the rebel leader, Barabbas, who's a robber and is, escapes out of the situation. Uh, his name is Jesus, son of the father. Mm. As far as, and I, I guess I, I want to jump and ask you just point blank. Why not? Um, do you, well, two, two point question. Do you believe that there was an actual historical Jesus? If so, who was he? All right, which is which is part of that. Let's just start there. Let's just start there. Yes, I do believe there was a historical Jesus. I believe he was the Egyptian, uh, but not only the Egyptian. But <laughs> for for now, let's <laughs> stick with it. That's what <laughs> see see. This is the issue that I have, Lena. And, and look, I totally agree with you. In fact, I've coined a phrase. Histomythicist, okay? No, but I, I'm not gonna. You know what? I, if you're gonna say that it's a, it's a count, it's a, what, what do you call well, it? They use more than no, one. No, you no, think it's no, primarily no, I one? Think he is. Okay. I really do think he is the Egyptian. Okay. But I think that the New Testament, in its incredibly clever way, it's not that there are several people who are Jesus. It is that. Uh, the Egyptian is several people in the New Testament. <laughs> all you right, know, all right. So I like you that. Get the difference. Primarily, it is the Egyptian. Now, does... it's the Egyptian. It is the Egyptian. No, it's. I would say it's a hundred percent the Egyptian. And they just but added some things onto they, him. But but Jesus. But there are several people in the New Testament who's Egyptian. Barabbas is also Jesus. You know what Barabbas means? Son of the Father. Yeah. And his name in Matthew is Jesus Barabbas. Okay. So the guy, the rebel leader Barabbas, who's a robber and is escapes out of the situation. Uh, his name is Jesus, son of the father. Mm. <laughs> this is he fun. Escapes out of the fight, just like the Egyptian. But but, you know, this is what I'm telling you. It, this is what I feel, that the, the truth is there in the New Testament, too. So if, 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 if the Egyptian wasn't crucified, then there is someone in the New Testament who wasn't crucified as well. Because the whole history is there. Interesting way of looking at it. I never would have thought about it like this. So, so let me ask you, I guess, getting to the next obvious question I have, since this is about the shift in time. I'm not going to title it that. I want more people to see this. I want as many possible people who are watching this show to click this button and listen to what you just said. Here, here's one of the things I want to ask you. Do you think they purposely and for theological, num numerological, religious purposes placed it in the 30s so that it was exactly one generation away from the temple's destruction, that 40-year gap? into the 30s under Pilate so that there's that 40 years like in the, the wilderness with Moses idea being repeated here? I I don't know. I haven't thought about that, and, and I'm not sure. I can tell you why I think they moved it from the 50s. Um, I cannot say for sure why they moved it to the 30s. My, my reasoning behind – well, first of all, why did they move it? Because they didn't want to – competition and, and, and Josephus was publishing and, and he was a famous guy in those days. And he wasn't the only one. Uh, Justice from, of Tiberius was also publishing, although his, his writings are lost. But, you know, there were competing narratives of the same period and of the same people. That is my explanation why they would move it so that there would not be competing narratives. Now, why they moved it to the 30s? Maybe another reason they could have moved it to the 30s is because there was no there there in the 30s. There was no, <laughs> there were no robbers. There were no other messianic leaders. There was, there were nothing in history that, that could, you know, it was empty, so to speak. Not empty. I mean, but, but I'm sure that every line in the New Testament means something. 
Every word is there for a reason. Nothing is just thrown in there for no reason. Uh, but you can, it's not always so easy to find it because it's so cleverly put, put there. And not everything is 20 years later. The, the main story is 20 years later, but you find the Jewish war in there too. There are, there are, there are parallels to the Jewish war in, in, and I have in, in uh, both in the book, A Shift in Time and in the paper, a lengthy parallel between acts and the story, uh, of of uh, of of Peter and when they're when they're preaching in the temple after the crucifixion, and and something that's happening at the beginning of the Jewish war with Menahem, who was a, a, a rebel leader, and you put them next to each other, and it's, it's not one parallel, it's not two parallel, it's not three parallels, it's like thirty parallels or at least twenty five. It's it's so convincing that this is. You know, it's statistically very strong that these are two parallel narratives, but it's not. That's not 20 years later. That's the Jewish war, and so every time, every time I, I look at it, I, I I see a new thing, and what I really think is the consistent story, historical narrative of the New Testament, is the story of the Jewish rebellion against Rome, and. The Egyptian is fit at a particular time there, which is in the 50s. That's the time of the Egyptian. But there is other stuff in there. I mean, as I said, they throw in theaters in the, and, and, and just take theaters. I mean, theaters is really interesting because once you see that there's a parallel between the Egyptian and Jesus and you say, oh, OK, who's the guy that came before the Egyptian? Well, the last messianic leader that that uh, Josephus mentions before the Egyptian is Theodos. Okay? Now, who was Theodos? Well, Theodos was this messianic leader, rebel leader, who gathered people where? By the Jordan River. But the uh, the authorities, which is the, it's not Herod Antipas in this case, it's it's Fadus, who's a, who's a Roman procurator, they, he doesn't like him. So he sends out all these soldiers. And what do they do with Theodos? They cut off his head and they carry it to Jerusalem. I mean, this is, oh, uh, guys, this is great. This is great. I love this. So this, all of it, like you said, it fits this puzzle. And, and Theodos, I mean, it, all these details makes me ask cuz i'm sure you go to judah we might as well go to judas the galilean too while we're here and have you discuss that before i get to a point i think where i'd like to ask some other questions but does what else is theodos cuz this is john the baptist obviously pictured here beheaded by herod the great correct if i'm not mistaken no no and, herod and pass in the in the in the gospels but right. but but fathers in in josephus i didn't mean the great sorry but so totally different people. Exactly. But that's the whole thing. So how do you shift something in time? How do you do that? There's only one way to do that because we didn't, the, the, at, those, in those, at, at that time, you didn't have, you know, BCE or, or CE or whatever you want to call it. You had dignitaries. That's how you had time, how you fixed time. It's the X year of Tiberius' reign. It's the, uh, you know, that's how you fixed time. And so the only way to present a time is by presenting a dignitary and the year of his, usually, <laughs> reign. That's the only way to present time. So how do you shift time? You shift dignitaries. Do you think that Josephus, or, or, or whoever, obviously Josephus who wrote this, and his cohort, his his group, said, we're monopolizing this time. So if you're going to write anything, you're going to have to place it in another time. Do you think that's what happened? Or do you think for their no, own no, life? No, it, no, it's not. No, I mean, listen. The year 70 is the big catastrophe of, of the Jewish realm. Okay, it's it's Jerusalem is destroyed. People are dispersed. Few people remain fighting on Masada for another three years. It's the end it's the end of history there. 
you could write a story and nobody would know if it was true or not because everybody's either dead or gone. And especially since the Gospels were written, you know, outside, they were they were written after the Jewish war uh, and 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 they were written, you know, presumably in Greek and they were written for another audience somewhere else. OK. So you could have gotten away with writing anything. But there were other historians and there were other historians who were outside and who survived and who wrote the history of that period. And the most famous one is Josephus. The surviving one is Josephus. We know of at least one more, just as of Tiberius, and there could have been others. But Josephus, he was a friend of Titus. I mean, this was a major player. You know, he had a statue in Rome. He has his books in, 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 in the libraries. This is not, not nobody. He was the, the historian of, of the people that people expected would not exist anymore. That was his, I mean, he, he's a very interesting guy, Josephus. He, he was, he was a, a commander in the war against the Romans and he switched sides. You know, he was a survivor. You could call it. But he had, and he became a friend of the Romans. He became part of the of the uh, of the court. But he had this thing: I'm I have to save for posterity the history of my people. And so he wrote the an enormous body of work, especially about the first century, and not only, but especially about the first century. And you know, and it's very detailed, and. What's interesting is uh, there are a lot of people who are writing about whether Luke read uh, Josephus. Uh, I think he did because there are many phrases and, and ways of reasoning that are s similar. In any event, if he didn't read Josephus, then the people who were putting together later uh, the Gospels and, and the other writings into the New Testament for sure knew about Josephus. There was an alter alternative narrative that was established. Um, you, if you write a religious story rather than just a historical story, I mean, history is always skewed, but it, it didn't have, but, uh, Josephus didn't have any religious sort of um, uh, motivations, let's put it that way. So he, he just wanted to tell the truth, be, albeit perhaps skewed, but that was the, the people who wrote both the Old Testament and the New Testament, they had to consider the religious needs. And so when Josephus, who hated the Messianic claimants, who hated the rebels, who called them all kinds of nasty names, and he, he did not like the Egyptian. I mean, he called them a false prophet, a, a charlatan. You know, you don't want to compete with that narrative. And so... That is my hypothesis of why they would shift it. I don't know why they would shift it. I'm, I'm certain they did shift it because if you, if you look at this, at, at the thirties, you don't find anything that fits nothing. I mean, you may find names, but you don't find activities that fit. And, and we're talking dignitaries. We're not only talking Jesus here. And if you shift it, it suddenly all fits. Um, and, you, and you I, I keep, can only, you have to keep coming back to the show. We've got to have you keep doing this. <laughs> I, I, okay. Uh, I, I cannot be sure of why they shifted it, but my, my, my main uh, interpretation is that they didn't want to have competing narratives. Got a question for you then. Uh, number one, wasn't supposedly Josephus a rebel himself, supposedly? Um, and then number two, the Egyptian, does that also line up with the magic Jesus kind of ideas that this guy could have been more than just some, hardcore Torah Orthodox guy. He he could have prob probably been like a, a healer type. Of well, Messianic. the whole thing about Egypt, if we should uh, remember the Josephus question, okay, and we'll take the, the, because the thing about Egypt, we haven't talked about it yet, but um, there are about four arguments, uh, and I line them up, why Jesus not only went to Egypt as a child and returned as a child, but that he actually returned as an adult, just like the Egyptian. Um, 
the first argument, um, now I don't want to rank them, but one of the arguments, they, let's say, is, is the uh, very comparatively early, you could call it anti-Christian description uh, that you find with the, with, where there's a lot of description of Jesus, which is very early. It's, it's Aletheus Logos. Uh, by Celsus that came around 175. And the only reason we have it is that Origen wrote a book called Contra Celsum, which was against Celsus. But he quotes Celsus there. And Celsus at length, he quotes him. So Origen, the church father, writes a book to refute Celsus. And in this book, which is, um, you know, Wherever he got that information, he claims that Jesus um, was came from a very poor single mother and he went to Egypt, you know, as a young man. And he came back having learned magic skills. And this is what Celsus writes. He came back as an as an adult, obviously, not as a as a child. That's 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 one. Two is that uh, the Talmud. Uh, in, 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 in Talmud, you do find descriptions which are in general interpreted to be, and which were very controversial in the Middle Ages, and they had to strike them out, etc., are considered references to Jesus. Uh, and he's there called Ben Stada or Ben Pantera. He's several names. But uh, uh, Celsus call, says actually that Jesus was the son of a soldier by the name of Pantera. So, uh, so he's there called Ben Pantera, and Ben Pantera also comes from Egypt and has learned magic skills. Um, comes back. Third argument is that in in um, sort of the Middle Ages, and there are several uh, quotes of this. Christian authors wrote that the Jews called Jesus the Egyptian. Or the Egyptian destroyer, or that his father was called the Egyptian. And this, this is what Christian authors write that, that the Jews say about Jesus. Okay. So that's another, to call him the Egyptian. That's another argument. Another argument, uh, is that when Jesus comes to Nazareth, you know, and he's like around 30 years old, and nobody recognizes him at first. Where has he been? And then when they start recognizing him, they connect him to his family, to his siblings. It's like, oh, it's that guy that we saw so many. Where has he been all those years? But the most important argument, I, I've listed. I <laughs> I love this. The last one is, is the most important one. And that is in Matthew where it says, now I don't remember the exact wording, but it says in the Gospel of Matthew, right after Jesus comes back as a child with his parents from Egypt, it says, at that time, John the Baptist started preaching in the wilderness. Now, John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus. What is he doing preaching as a child? And, and it's not the only thing you find, you find there, but, but you, you, he starts preaching in the, is it the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius? Now that's a very long time after the death of Herod the Great, which is when Jesus was, was supposed to, to return. That's about 23 years later. So 